I'm going to ask if he sees opportunity right now. Joshua Freeman's with us, co-founder, co-chairman, and of course, co-CEO of Canyon Partners, where he oversees roughly $27 billion in assets. You are quite the celebrity in the Milken Halls, and Josh, it's great to have some time with you. Are you here having conversations and seeing opportunity at the moment? Well, I think in the distressed world specifically, the opportunity is not really in the corporate world. There are obviously situational things here and there, but if you look in real estate, for example, three out of the major sectors have, major five sectors have a certain amount of distress. Retail malls, uh, particularly regional ones, uh, the three major players are all suffering. One's in bankruptcy and others actually just went in bankruptcy as well. CBL, Penn REIT, Washington REIT. Those are clearly opportunities to repurpose assets. Uh, you look at uh, hospitality, hotels, that's not going to revive itself quite the way it was in the past. So I think uh, a corporate use of uh, offices is also changing. We haven't quite figured out what that means with more people working from home, more people dispersing where they live and how they live, different square footages per, per person. So there's quite a lot of turmoil in the real estate world. Uh, but in pure corporate, uh, we're having a huge bull market right now. People are issuing equity. Multiples are enormous. So debt levels are not, are not choking many players. What's the competition like? There's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines for everything. So the challenge is to try to find things that don't fit into standard categories. If you look at standard categories of things like high yield or investment grade debt or even equities, they're all trading based on very, very low interest rates. In fact, negative interest rates. High yield, if you look at it today, 85% of the high yield market is trading at a lower yield than the last inflation print. So it's offering you a negative yield. So you really need to find things that are different, that are alternatives, that provide a higher yield opportunity. I mean, you have to be fascinated by this. So, I mean, you go back to when you started your career, when a lot of what you did and what Mike Milken did, I mean, you were almost on the sidelines with regards to the way people viewed what you did, and now it is mainstream. But you also started at a time when interest rates were the flip side of where we are today. They were, and I remember those days of taking our student yeah. loans and putting them in the Fidelity overnight yeah. account and earning a huge spread on them until we had to actually pay yeah. for the tuition. But we've actually come full circle in a way because one of the things that Mike pioneered is he pioneered access to capital for entrepreneurs, including leveraged buyout firms. So a great deal of what we were doing was providing interesting and innovative financing for acquisitions by private equity firms. If you look at today, a great deal of what we're doing is exactly that. But it's driven by something else. Back then, there were few buyout firms, and they were trying to get debt from someplace other than a commercial bank. And the alternatives were very sparse. Today, there's this tremendous competition because there are so many private equity firms running all over the place trying to consummate acquisitions, and they need to have the capital committed. And in many cases, that has to be done quickly, quietly, and effectively. And those are the places where you can earn a yield that doesn't look like the conventional high yield market. Are you expecting or bracing yourself for more options, more, more opportunities as we see perhaps not a normalization, but perhaps a backing off of the amount of stimulus we're having? There's IMF talking about volatility cross asset. They brace themselves. Do you ex anticipate that? Well, there are opportunities today, both, as I said, acquisitions by, by uh, private equity firms. If you look in real estate, another area would be loans to construction projects. It can be shovel ready, simple infill apartment buildings, but banks won't give much more than 50% financing. So there are opportunities. But I think we'll get a lot more of the turmoil and security picking part of the market down the road. Right? How far down the road? Well, it depends. Uh, right now, we're in this, this situation where rates are being held low and it's driving valuations to crazy levels for everything. But it feels very toppy. It feels frothy. And when those things happen, you always have a correction. So uh, people are availing themselves of cheap debt. They're leveraging up. A lot of business models are being transformed very rapidly by software, by the internet, so the competitive churn is quite significant. So I'm quite sure there'll be a lot of opportunities. There always are. It's a matter of being patient. When exactly those will arise is not always clear. So everything you just said, though, has a lot of people, or at least some people, pounding the table and saying, this is now the time where the Fed needs to pull back. This is now the time where the government, fiscal policy, needs to pull back. We're in an inflationary environment. Whether it's persistent or transitory, that is a debate to be had. But inflation is real. It's here. How does that 
distort the investment it's, plan. It's not a shock that that's happened. Mm -hmm. We've had a V-shaped recovery, and we were in a super strong environment before COVID hit. We would expect that to continue once COVID goes away. Mm -hmm. We had a little bit of a false alarm about it going away. It feels like it's going away a little more effectively now. Maybe it always lives with us in some fashion. But people want to get out. So we don't have we have inflation now because uh, we were at sort of a just-in-time economy mm -hmm. where the the pervasive availability of uh, artificial intelligence made supply chains super efficient. There's not inventory all over the system. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it gets walloped by COVID and now you have demand revive like crazy and supply can't catch up with it. So we have disequilibria everywhere mm -hmm. and it's not surprising in that situation you get inflation. Now whether it's transitory or whether it's longer term may depend on other things. Mm -hmm. The Fed can ease back a certain amount and that's generally reversible. But the Treasury had, there's a lot of unspent yeah. money in the last stimulus bills, and now we're talking about another large one. So we've basically stepped on both accelerators right at the time when the economy was already turning. Mm -hmm. And it may be too late to stop some of that and turn it back on a more normal course without a lot of disruption and, and a hangover from a debt balance that looks more like a World War II level debt balance mm -hmm. than it does during a peace, as a peacetime debt balance. Someone who's been using the world war analogy too is Scott Miner at Guggenheim. And we were talking to him about you know this bull market. He sees it continuing. He said China's uninvestable. How are you looking at the disruption that's happening from a regulatory perspective in other parts of the world? Well, emerging economies that have super high growth and changing business models, there's always going to be a certain amount of disruption that comes to that. And I wouldn't say it's completely uninvestable. For us, we tend to focus on credit-related securities, and we tend to place, focus on places where we've done a lot of investing, which basically means the U.S., Western Europe, once in a while, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, etc. Um, there are, tend to be knock-on effects in other economies. So, for example, we just did a financing of a real estate project in London, where the sponsor was was Chinese. And I think far excessive alarm about what's going in, on in China in general in the property market caused that to be an extraordinarily great opportunity with very low risk and very high yield, much higher than it would have been had you not had uh, something like the Evergrande situation going on at the same time. So I think there are ways to play around the edges without going uh, full bore into China that maybe suit us a little better than suit people who are more accustomed to being in the jurisdiction itself. Well, a lot of experience, of course, navigating these waters. Josh, really great to see you.